you have his word, and I hope you do, let me invite you to open with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. If you don't have a Bible, maybe look on with somebody around you, or know that we've got out in the lobby Bibles every week that you can pick up for free on your way in if you, if you need one. So let me invite you to find 1 Corinthians chapter, I said 5, actually chapter 6, and, and then pull out those notes that you received in the worship guide when you, when you came in. We are journeying through the book of 1 Corinthians in the Bible, and last week and this week we've come to this section of the book that specifically addresses discipline and disputes in the church. And I, I talked with a variety of people last week who were visiting Brook Hills for the first time, and I couldn't help but to think, man, you picked a great day to come, Church Discipline Week. And so, for any of you who came back, and for any of you who are visiting Brook Hills for the first time today, I joyfully announce to you that you have arrived on Church Discipline Week 2. So, we're looking at how God loves his people so much that he disciplines them when they wander into that which threatens to hurt or harm or destroy them. In the same way that every good parent in this room disciplines his or her children. Actually in a much better, much greater way because, well, when I discipline my children, I'm trying to discipline them for their good, but I don't always know what to do. I think about one of our children right now who will remain nameless. And Heather and I have had conversation after conversation recently about how to address this particular child with this particular issue. I'm going to try to keep this general here. Over the past few months, and we've, we've tried one path of discipline, and it hasn't done anything. I mean, totally ineffective. But then we've said to each other, well, we just need to be consistent. So we've stuck with that path. Until weeks later, after it still hasn't worked, we've looked at each other and said, well, we may be ineffective parents, but at least we're consistent in our ineffectiveness. And so we, we tried other things, and it seemed like that only made it worse until about a week ago. We, we tried one thing, and voila. All of a sudden, they're like the perfect child. And we've looked at each other and said, we are incredible parents. (laughs) Now, I say all that to emphasize that we are obviously not incredible parents. But the point is, we've got good hearts and desires. We, We want to love our children well. We don't know how to do it. We lack wisdom. We don't always know what is best for each one of our kids. But the beauty is, God, our Father, is perfect. He is all wise. He is all-knowing. He knows us perfectly. He loves us perfectly. And so he disciplines us. And as he disciplines us, he always, always, always knows what's best for us. So it's, it's like these two weeks we're having a family conversation and we're talking about how our Father, in his wisdom, instructs his children to carry out his discipline in a way that shows love to his children. Even to the point, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, which we looked at last week, of taking the extreme step of actually removing a brother from the church because he continues in unrepentant sin. So last week we talked about how that is one of the most loving things a church can do. We talked about how, in a sense, as disciples, as followers of Jesus, we experience discipline on a day-by-day, week-by-week basis. We're constantly being transformed and renewed and challenged and convicted and conformed more into the image of Christ. The the life of a disciple is a life of discipline. So every day, every week, we want to become more like Christ. And in so doing, to become better husbands and better wives and better moms and better dads and better sons and daughters and better men, which we'll dive into even more specifically next week on Father's Day, and better women. Yet we know that we're all prone to wander away from God and His Word. We're all prone, every single one of us, including myself, prone to wander into sin in ways that are not good for us and not good for our families and not good for the church and not good for those who don't know Christ and not good ultimately for the glory of God. So we love one another as individuals and small groups and even in the most 
extreme cases as the entire church to call one another back to Christ, all by the grace of God. So last week we looked at a process that Jesus outlines in Matthew chapter 18 for reaching out to a brother or sister who's caught in sin, a process that is playing out in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. You look at the last verse of 1 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul says to the church at Corinth, purge the evil person from among you. Now, again, for those of you who may be visiting, particularly if you're not a follower of Jesus, you do not need to be worried at this point, thinking, man, they're going to kick somebody out today, and I don't know what's who it's going to be? Could it be me? So sum up what we talked about last week. This is specifically talking about when someone who claims to be a Christian as a member of the church is deliberately walking away from God and His Word despite repeated calls in the love of God to come back from people around that person. Eventually the entire church, Paul says there comes a point for that person's good to realize the seriousness of the, their sin for the good of the church and for the glory of God to remove that person from among you. Now what I want to do today is see what Paul says next. I want us to read the first half of chapter 6 and I want us to see how Paul moves almost seamlessly from talking about church discipline to talking about church disputes. And then he brings it all back together in the last part of what we're going to read. So I want to read from the first half of chapter 6. Think about church disputes and then bring everything together to think about how, how do we apply this word about church discipline and church disputes in the church at Brook Hill. So let's start 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 1. Paul says, When one of you has a grievance against another, does he dare go to law before the unrighteous instead of the saints? Or you do not know that the saints will judge the world. And if the world is to be judged by you, are you incompetent to try trivial cases? Do you not know that we are to judge angels? How much more than matters pertaining to this life? So if you have such cases, why do you lay them before those who have no standing in the church? I say this to your shame. Can it be that there is no one among you wise enough to settle a dispute between the brothers? But brother goes to law against brother, and that before unbelievers? To have lawsuits at all with one another is already a defeat for you. Why not rather suffer wrong? Why not rather be defrauded? But you yourselves wrong and defraud, even your own brothers. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Okay, so what does the Bible say about church disputes, about civil disputes between church members? So this was huge in the city of Corinth where the people who were reading this letter lived. The Greeks in Corinth loved going to court. Litigation was a part of everyday life, a form of challenge, even entertainment to some degree. Most of it driven by desire for selfish gain, to get ahead, to gain advantage over one another if you can. Now, lest that sound confusing or foreign to us, just look around us. Ken Sandy, founder of Peacemakers, which is a ministry that helps navigate churches through legally how to carry out 1 Corinthians chapter 6 type ministry, writes, by all accounts, America has become the most litigious society on the face of the earth, with millions and millions of cases being filed in state courts every year. We live in a very litigious culture, and professing Christians are right in the middle of it, filing literally millions of lawsuits every year, often against one another, costing billions of dollars. And this is a word from God that we need to hear. God says to the church at Corinth then and to the church in America now, when one of you has a grievance against one another, does he dare Go to law before the unrighteous instead of the saints. And if that's not strong enough, Paul gets down to verse 5. He says, I say this to your shame. In other words, wake up. This should not be. And it shouldn't be. 
if the church is doing what the church is supposed to do. I came across a quote from Warren Burger, former Chief Justice of the U.S. Supreme Court, and he said, listen to this. He said, one reason our courts have become so overburdened is because Americans are increasingly turning to the courts for relief from a range of personal distresses and anxieties, remedies for personal wrongs that once were considered the responsibilities of institutions other than the courts are now boldly asserted as legal entitlements. Then he says this, the courts have been expected to fill the void created by the decline of church, family, and neighborhood unity. That's the chief justice of the Supreme Court saying 30 years ago, what Paul said to the church 2,000 years ago, the courts are filling a void that's been created by the decline of the church and our understanding of what the church is supposed to do. So think about what the Bible is saying here, what God is saying in His Word. The overall problem is that Christians in Corinth were taking one another to court in the same way that non-Christians in Corinth were taking one another to court, which is amazing in light of the previous chapter. They were ignoring unrepentant incest in the church. Then they were suing one another over trivial matters. And Paul diagnoses the problem in three ways. So Christians suing Christians is wrong for three reasons. One, here in Corinth, Christians were denying the wisdom they had in the church. So from the very beginning of this chapter, Paul sets up a clear distinction between those who are inside the church and those who are outside the church. Those who are followers of Christ, those who are not followers of Christ. You're in Verse 1, it's the unrighteous and the saints. Now, there's some debate over whether or not Paul, when he says the unrighteous, is just referring to judges in general, because most, if not all, the judges in Corinth at this point would likely not have been followers of Christ, or if he's referring specifically to the unjust nature of many judges in that day. There's a lot of evidence that the whole court system in Corinth was pretty corrupt. Regardless, though, the point that Paul's making is the same. You don't need to go to court, Christians, because you have, in trivial matters within the church, because you have the wisdom of Christ available to you as members of the church. He points to the picture of heaven that we see emphasized later in Scripture, where we're told that Christians will play some part in judging the world and even angels. We don't know all that means, but he says, do you realize the wisdom you have available to you in the church to settle these kinds of disputes? After all he talked about, wisdom in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, Paul says every single member of the church, even the member who you think has the least standing in the church, has the spirit of Christ in them, the mind of Christ, to use his language from 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and is able by the spirit of Christ, with the wisdom of Christ, to settle a dispute between believers better than the most highly trained judge who does not have the word of Christ or the spirit of Christ in them. Now, Be careful. This is not to say that Christians should never, ever be in court, that we should not respect judges who don't know Christ. We're going to get to that in a minute. But don't miss the point here. When Christians take other Christians to court, they are deliberately denying the wisdom that Christ has given to his church. Second, Christians in Corinth were destroying the witness they had in the world. The exclamation point in Paul's argument comes in verse 6 when he says, brother goes to law against brother. And that So not only to be judged by unbelievers, but doing all of this before unbelievers. They were showing the world that there's nothing distinct about the church at all. In in fact, in their divisiveness, in their disputes, everybody's suing each other. They were deliberately contradicting the words of Christ in John 13, 35. By this, all all men will know that you're my disciples. When you do what? When you love one another. And they were showing the exact opposite. They were showing Corinth not what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. And then on top of all this, these Christians in Corinth were disobeying the will of God in the gospel. Paul finishes this argument by saying, you you get to court with another believer, and it doesn't matter who wins the lawsuit at this point. You have both already lost. It's already a defeat for you. Why? Because you've missed the whole point of the gospel. Think with me about what was driving these lawsuits. Desire for gain. A desire to get something from someone else. A desire to assert rights. Something that was huge in Corinth and something that is huge in our culture today. I have a right to this, we think. I deserve this. 
I have a right to sue this person for this or that. And as long as we think like this, then we are thinking just like the Christians at Corinth and we along with them are missing the whole point of the gospel. Think about it. We have a Savior who deliberately gave up his rights for our good, right? That's the whole point of the cross. And it's exactly how he taught his church to live. I put Matthew chapter 5, verse 39 through 40 in parentheses in this next point because Jesus says, do not resist the one who's evil. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, what do you do? You turn to him the other also. If anyone would sue you and take your tunic, Jesus says, let him have your cloak as well. Those radical words had been completely forgotten or ignored in Corinth and in the lives of American Christians all over our culture, overly obsessed with our rights. Paul says the same thing in just a couple chapters before, what we saw in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 12 to 13. When reviled, we bless. When persecuted, we endure. When slandered, we entreat. Later in 1 Thessalonians 5, 15, see that no one repays evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another and to everyone. Now, I'm not saying this is all simple, black and white, easy to think through, but the Bible is saying very clearly that when we assert our rights to gain from others, we're missing the whole point of the gospel because in the gospel, we sacrifice our rights to show the love of of Christ to others. You say, are you serious? To sacrifice our rights? I'm not making this up. This is God's word. Why not, read it, why not rather suffer wrong? Why not rather be defrauded? The wisdom of this world says that is unwise. Stick up for yourself. You have a right to do this. That's what the wisdom of this world says. The wisdom of the cross says the exact opposite. So which are we going to choose? In the gospel, we choose to sacrifice our rights and we strive for reconciliation with one another in Christ. I put Romans 12, 1 through 21 in parentheses there because that chapter just sums up the heart behind what Paul's saying here. He says at the very beginning of that chapter, do not be conformed any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So you think differently Christian. You act differently. In what way? And these are the commands he gives you. Love one another with brotherly affection. You outdo one another in showing honor. You contribute to the needs of the saints. You seek to show hospitality. You bless those who persecute you. You live in harmony with one another. Repay no one evil for evil. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Never avenge yourselves, but leave it to God. To the contrary, if your enemy's hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. This is how the church is to live, which is very different than what the world says we should do. Even many times, Christian friends say we should do. So practically, here's the general principles that we take away here. And I want to emphasize general principles here because there are, there are all kinds of caveats, even potential exceptions that we could talk about. But these general principles are clear. First, we recognize in this text that Christians should settle disputes with other Christians in the church outside of court. According to God's word in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, Christians should not sue other Christians but should settle their disputes in the church outside of court. Notice that Paul doesn't even talk about the the subject matter of these lawsuits. As far as he's concerned, that's immaterial. Christians should not drag fellow Christians into court. Instead, the church should be the forum for resolving conflicts and disputes between its members. The church has the wisdom of Christ, the word of Christ, and as a community of brothers and sisters, you see how many times, particularly at the end, verse 6, 7, 8, Paul uses the word brothers. Christians are distinctly able to sit down as a family and work out disputes together. Now, notice, this passage is saying nothing about non-Christians going to court, saying nothing about Christians being forbidden to be in court with Non-Christians, the picture here is two church members. And I think the application goes across churches here. So any two Christians who are members of Bible-believing churches should make every reasonable effort to settle their disputes together in the church. Now, if, if that was the end of the story, we might open ourselves up to a variety of misunderstandings. So I wanted to include this next general principle as well, because this is not the only time the Bible speaks about this issue. We recognize in this text 
that yes, Christians should settle disputes with other Christians in the church outside of court. Yet, we remember from other texts that Christians should subject themselves to governing authorities for our good. So, Romans chapter 13, verse 1. Right after the passage I read just a second ago from Romans chapter 12, Romans 13, 1 says, that every person be subject to the governing authorities. The Bible goes on to say that God has appointed governing authorities to make judgments for our good. 1 Peter 2, 13 and 14 says the same thing. Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. And then I put a couple passages there in parentheses from, from Acts where Paul actually appeals to the government. So Paul who writes 1 Corinthians, writes Romans, appeals to the government and governmental law. So Paul is in no way saying here in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 that Christians are somehow above the law or above judgment by secular authorities. And he's not saying that all secular courts and secular judges are inherently unrighteous. He's actually saying the opposite. He's saying there's a place for them. The Bible teaches there's a place for them ordained by God. But that place is not judging minor disputes between two members of the church. Now, again, there are obvious caveats and exceptions there, here. There are some things that we address in the church that require civil court action in our country. They require. We don't have a choice. And there are clearly crimes that require criminal court action. So there are cases where we are required by law to notify law enforcement, whether it's, whether it's abuse or neglect. And there are times like these and others where it may be most appropriate to not just do what is required with legal remedies, but also pursue spiritual remedy in the church as well in a parallel, parallel fashion. So I want to be clear. We're not saying, the Bible's not saying we're above the law here. But the general principles are the same. We recognize in this text that Christians should settle disputes with other Christians in the church outside of court. And at the same time, we remember from other texts that Christians should sub subject themselves to governing authorities for our good. And in any given situation, we apply both of these principles as best as possible. And just to encourage you, a quick example without going into the spe specifics. This is happening. This has happened in this church. I immediately, when I come to this text, I think about one scenario between members of our church who were, were, had a business dealing with each other that needed resolution, that was major dispute, they came to the church and said, how can we solve this? And we sat down with them, even with some legal counsel they had, and we prayed together, we sought the Lord, His Word, and the Lord brought about reconciliation in that. Now, it wasn't easy, it took work. The kind of work that, to be honest, I think this is why most churches in our culture don't emphasize doing this because it's work. But if we don't do this, if we choose simply to take other Christians to court, then we are deliberately disobeying God, plain and simple. And so we settle disputes in the church while obviously subjecting ourselves to governing authorities for our good as necessary, as wise. Now, that leads us to discipline disputes in the church of Brickhill. So what are we to do? 21st century America, the city of Birmingham, is the church of Brook Hills. How are we to apply 1 Corinthians 5, 1 through 6, 11? And this is where I want to give us just four general exhortations with a myriad, myriad of brief, simple exhortations underneath them, but four ways in general that we as a faith family call the church at Brook Hills. I believe as your pastor, we must respond to the word of God that has spoken to us here. So first, let's obey with the love of Christ. Let's obey, obey with love. So if we don't obey what we're seeing in the word here, we are dishonoring God. If we do not carry out church discipline like 1 Corinthians chapter 5 says, which we've not done, and if we don't address disputes, like chapter 6 says, which we've not always done that either, then we are dishonoring God. We are not faithfully fulfilling our commission as the church of Jesus Christ. So let's obey. It's not an option for us. Let's obey with love. 
So let's do church discipline, not just because we love righteousness, which I hope we do. It's a huge motivation here. But let's do church discipline, not just because we love righteousness, but also because we long for a brother or sister's restoration. So both of these things drive us. A love for righteousness and a longing for restoration. James 5, 19-20 says, My brothers, if one of you should wander from the truth and someone should bring him back, remember this, whoever turns a sinner from the error of his way will save him from death and cover over a multitude of sins. That's what we want. That's what we long for. Righteousness in the church, restoration in each other's lives. And then let's settle church disputes, not only because we have a responsibility to do this, but also because we desire reconciliation through this. Because in the language of Ephesians chapter 4, we want to bear with one another in love and we're eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. So see the heart, feel the heart behind 1 Corinthians 5 and 6. And, And what I did is I just listed here some practical ways that we can make sure to keep this heart, so a heart of love, at the forefront of discipline and disputes in the church at Brook Hills. My prayer is, my prayer is that years down the road, together, we might look back, if the Lord hasn't come back, that we might look back over 10 years of intentionally putting 1 Corinthians 5 and 6 into practice, and we would say, this is the most loving thing I have ever seen in the church. That's my prayer. So how can we do that? Well, by God's grace, first, let's let's be humble. Let's remember at every moment in discipline and disputes that we are all sinners in need of God's grace. If we are not careful, these practices can quickly and easily degenerate into a self-righteous spirit all across this church that's always suspicious of others and eager to point out others' faults. And we must guard against that temptation. We must guard against that temptation with a humble awareness of our constant need for God's grace in every single one of our lives. It flows into a patient humility with each other. This is where Proverbs 19.11 and Colossians 3.13 are so helpful. Proverbs 19.11 said, A man's wisdom gives him patience. It is to his glory to overlook an offense. Did you hear that? To overlook an offense. So patience is willing, when it's wise, to overlook offenses. Colossians 3.13 says, bear with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, forgive each other as the Lord has forgiven you. So there are times we need to humbly and patiently just bear with one another and forgive complaints against one another. You might say, well, how do you know when to overlook an offense and when not to? That leads to the second exhortation here. Let's be biblical. So what guides us in All discipline and all disputes, it's God's Word. When it comes to church discipline, this is definitively not designed by God for addressing pet peeves or things you just don't like about somebody else. Church discipline is designed by God to address clear areas of disobedience. You look at 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 11. Paul says, I'm writing, you must not associate with anyone who calls himself a brother, but is sexually immoral or greedy, an idolater or a slanderer, a drunkard or a sw- swindler. With such a man, do not even eat. These are specific sins that clearly violate God's word and need to be addressed in the church. So that's the picture here. This is sin. So when you're, when you're thinking, okay, is this serious enough to, to not overlook? Does this need to be addressed? Do I need to help restore a brother or sister? Here's some questions I would encourage you to ask. One, is there unrepentant sin that is dishonoring God? Obviously, that's the point in 1 Corinthians 5, this immorality, as well as these lists that we see in verse 11, chapter 6, verse 9 and 10. These are things that were clearly dishonoring God. Is there unrepentant sin that is denying the gospel? 1 Timothy 1, 18 through 20. 2 Timothy 2, 17 and 18. Paul addresses church members who need to be confronted for teaching doctrine that's contrary to the gospel and God's word. If there is sin that is denying the gospel, that needs to be addressed in the church. Third, is there unrepentant sin that is detrimental to a brother or sister? So ask, is there sin that's hurting a brother or sister? And likely, other brothers and sisters in the process. And I put Hebrews 10, 24 through 31 there. We don't have time to go there, but two main reasons. One, because those verses talk about the detriment deadly, dangerous detriment that awaits those who know the truth of Christ and yet refuse to turn from their sin. 
And the other reason I put that passage there is because that passage begins with a warning not to neglect meeting together. And this is huge because it's, it's not uncommon for someone in our church culture and in this church to become a member of the church and then at some point in the future to kind of drift off from the church in six weeks, maybe six months or whatever go by and they're totally disconnected from the church. That is not good. We are not caring for our brother or sister well at all in that position. And their neglect when it comes to meeting together needs to be confronted in grace for their good and for the good of this body that God has gifted them to build up. So is there unrepentant sin that is detrimental to a brother or sister? Is there unrepentant sin that is harming the unity of the church on either a personal level or on a, on a church-wide corporate level? When you look back at Matthew 18, you see that Jesus is specifically addressing when your brother sins against you. And so if there's, if there's sin that a brother has committed or sister has committed against you or you have done with someone else, then that, that creates disunity that needs to be reconciled. Otherwise, that sin snowballs and prevents the intimacy that God has designed for you and me as brothers and sisters in Christ. It's part of a body who belongs to one another. And there's also precedent in the New Testament for addressing sin that threatens the unity of the whole church. Romans chapter 6, verse 17 and 18. Paul says, I urge you, brothers, to watch out for those who cause divisions and put obstacles in your way that are contrary to the teaching you have learned. Keep away from them. For such people are not serving our Lord Christ but their own appetites. By smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the minds of naive people. So when someone is promoting division in the church, it needs to be addressed. Titus 3, 9 through 11, warns about those who are causing division. So if there's sin that is hurting the unity of the church, personally, on a whole, this needs to be addressed. And then the last question I would encourage you to ask, is there unrepentant sin that is hurting the witness of the church? Which is certainly what's happening in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. This sin was appalling even to pagans. A man has his father's wife. And Paul's constantly addressing sin in the church that hurts the witness of the church. 1 Corinthians 2, 10, 32, Philippians 2, 14 and 15, 1 Thessalonians 4, 12. So that's, that's not necessarily an exhaustive list, but based on the precedent of what we see being addressed in the church in the New Testament, my encouragement is for us to ask these questions in the context of this faith family. For you and I, we cannot neglect this. This week, without going into details, and this is outside of our church, but... I saw pain and hurt and walked through with brothers and sisters a circumstance because no one was no one was loving enough to point out sin that needed to be pointed out. And it was destroying relationships and people's relationships with God. So I asked the question. You asked the question, is there sin in a brother or sister around you that is dishonoring God? Obviously in your own life, look in yourself, we'll get to that but that's dishonoring God? Is there sin that is denying the gospel that's detrimental to a brother or sister that's hurting the unity of the church, that's hurting the witness of the church? And when there is, then love each other enough to address that with one another. Let's be humble. Let's be biblical. Third, let's be pure. So that's the point of Matthew 7, 1 through 5. Why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye when there's a plank in your own eye? So we all know, let's just confess it, there is a tendency to see in others what we struggle in ourselves. So examine your life. When you see a brother or sister caught in sin, examine your life and look for any evidence of that sin in your life. And that in and of itself will be a humbling process. And examine your motives. So there are all kinds of wrong motives that that bring about abuses in church discipline. Anger, revenge, self-promotion, Abuse of authority, desire for control, all of these things are warned against in Scripture. So really ask yourself, am I going to this brother or sister out of love for their good to serve them, not to serve myself? Let's be pure. Let's be prayerful. This is huge. It seems so basic, but it's so overlooked. We need to realize, if a brother or sister is caught in sin, only Christ can bring them out of that sin. You can't do it. No matter how Hard you try what you say. Only Christ by His Spirit can do this. That's, I love First Timothy 2 here. We gently instruct a brother in sin in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth. God grants repentance. This is the work of God. Now this process 
is God's design for how he works. So he uses us in the process. We don't just sit back and pray and do nothing and say, well, God's going to do it. No, that's the last thing we do. That's what was happening this week. People say, well, God will take care of this. No, God will take care of this through you. So pray in dependence on God as you act. Let's be prayerful. Next, let's be quiet before others. Go to your brother or sister. So not to others to talk about your brother or sister. Be quiet. That's gossip. Zealously guard the character of Christ in your brothers or sisters. I mean, one of the most dangerous temptations when it comes to church discipline. Ephesians 4, 29. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only that which is good for building each other up, as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. So let's be quiet before others and go to each other. Let's be quiet before others, and let's be quick to act. Now, I don't mean that we need to rush through this process, but Scripture clearly teaches that we should not let sin grow in our own lives or in others' lives. Matthew 5, if you are offering your gift there at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, what do you do? You leave your gift there at the altar. First go and be reconciled to your brother, then come and offer your gift. The reality is the longer sin continues, the longer a brother or sister is caught in sin, the more challenging restoration will be in the end. So be quick to act. Don't wait. Yes, be patient with one another. Overlook offenses when it's wise. But when sin is dishonoring God, denying the gospel, detrimental to that brother or sister, hurting the unity or the witness of the church, then be quick to address it. Next, let's be gentle to others. Galatians 6.1, Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Gentleness. We, we know that when you're having a difficult conversation, Our attitude is going to speak far more loudly than our actual words. And so go in a spirit of gentleness. That's that's not a gentle softness about sin. This is a gentle firmness. But it's a a gentleness, a fruit of the Spirit in us that comes alongside a brother or sister. So we don't come from a position of superiority. They're inferior because they're struggling with this particular sin and continuing unrepentant. And we come alongside them. Acknowledging our own propensity to sin, acknowledging our own struggles with sin, and gentleness coming alongside them, addressing heart issues. That's what the, at the core of every sin issue, every unrepentant sin, there's a heart issue that requires gentle firmness. Let's be gentle to others, and let's be careful ourselves. Right after that in Galatians 6, 1, Paul says, but watch yourself, or you also may be tempted. So talking about sin, confronting sin in the church, this is spiritual warfare. And temptations abound for you in this process. So be careful. Be on guard against sin. And this is where I would just pause and remind us. This is yet another reason why church discipline is good. Because as we're loving enough to address sin in each other's lives, we will become so much more sensitive to sin in our own lives. And that is a very good thing. God's designed this process not just for others' sanctification. God's designed this process for each of our sanctification. So let's be humble, biblical, pure, prayerful, quick, quiet, gentle, careful, and let's be intentional. And this is where I I want us to just remember the process we saw last week in Matthew 18. And then I want to share a few important things that our elders have been praying through regarding what this looks like at Brook Hills. So we talked last week about how church discipline and restoration starts with private correction. You and I, we don't involve anyone else until that step is carried out. Now, again, there's, there's obvious rare instances where that would not apply. You think about a situation like child abuse. We don't expect that child to go to an abusing parent one-on-one. Like, this is a responsibility we take up as the church. But in most instances, except for extreme rare situations, begin with private correction. Then, second step, according to Jesus, small group clar- clarification. Again, the, the goal is to keep the circle as small as possible, as long as possible. So involve another brother or sister who can approach the situation with all these qualities we've talked about above. And then, if that brother or sister continues unrepentant in sin, even now after a small group of people has confronted him or her about it, then that leads to the step, third step, church admonishment. Tell it to the church, Jesus said. And we, we talked last week about how our elders have been praying and working through this, and we've, we have come to the conclusion that when Jesus says, tell it to the church, Jesus means, tell it to the church. A pretty sharp group of guys, and it took us a while to come to that, but but we think he he means tell it to the church. And and we talked last week about how it's a picture of God's love. God loves 
his children enough to send an entire body, an entire family of faith after a son or daughter who's wandering away from him. So what does this look like then in the church of Brook Hills? Because we've not done this. Well, here's the deal. Once these first two steps have been carried out and a brother or sister is still unrepentant in his or her sin, then our encouragement, my encouragement is for you to then involve your small group leader if they're not already involved in this process. And then, if necessary, an elder. And there are elders who are shepherds over all the small groups in our faith family. So go to your small group leader and then go to an elder. And after, after that small group leader, that elder have become involved, if indeed all the steps have been taken that could be taken, and that person is still unrepentant, then this elder will bring the situation to all of the elders. This kind of, this kind of thing has happened. It's actually happening right now with members of this body. So this is, this is not altogether new. The thing that we've not done up to this point is we've not said to the entire church, so this member in our midst, we'll use John, it's just a hypothetical name. I apologize to the Johns in this room. But John is a member in our church and is walking unrepentant in sin. And we need to pray for John. We need to seek after John. We've not come to the point where we've done that. But our elders are convinced that we need to do that. But here's the deal. We don't think we're at, at the point right now where we can do this because you as members of this church have not agreed to this. So many of you have become members of the Church of Brickhills Brickhills, without the slightest inclination or idea that this would ever be possible. Your name being told to the church because you are living in unrepentant sin. And as a result, we don't believe it would be appropriate for us to carry this out without you understanding what it means biblically to be a part of a church, this church that you're opening yourself up to this process if it's ever necessary, which hopefully, obviously, never will be necessary. So our plan is over the coming months, we're going to revise our membership process so that every member, every new member, and, and kind of, if, even if you've been a member before, in order to continue as a member, this would involve agreeing to, willingly submitting to a process of church discipline and restoration if that is ever necessary in your life that involves this picture of your name being told to the church and the church coming seeking after you. And so this is something that every single member would need to be willing to submit to if you're going to be a member of the Church of Brook Hills. You say, why are you doing that? We're doing that because the, the Bible says we need to do this. And, and it says this for your good. And so I want to say to this church, if I ever wander off in unrepentant sin, and I, though brothers and sisters have come to me and I'm still wandering off in repentance, I, I need the entire force of this body of Christ coming after me. I want that. And so this is what it means to be a member of, of a church. So our plan is over the coming months to, to, to get to that point. And then, based on that, if it's ever necessary, which obviously hope won't be, and, and by God's grace, it won't hardly be necessary for any of us. But if necessary, we'll tell it to the church. And in that situation, it's not that we're going to tell all the details of a certain situation, but, but generally, this brother or sister is living in unrepentant sin. And we'll do this not in a forum like this on Sunday morning or Sunday evening when there are all kinds of non-members, so there are many guests who are sitting among us now. That's not an appropriate time for us to do this, but a time we're trying to figure out exactly what this best looks like, but a time when only members of the church are present to pray and then to lovingly pursue that brother or sister. That's church admonishment. And then after that, Jesus says, if the brother or sister refuses to listen, even to the church, then the final step is church ex- excommunication. Now, again, this is happening now. This is happening right now. So our elders have approached, or are actually in the process of approaching various members to remove them from membership. So I'm not saying, well, if there's a situation that warrants potential excommunication, just, just wait until we figure out some things a few months down the road. No, this is happening. So involve your small group leader, and then an elder when necessary, knowing that we, we don't believe we're in a position to involve the whole church in a way that Matthew 18, 1 Corinthians 5 is telling us to tell it to the church, but we're taking steps to make that a reality. In the meantime, we are. We're carrying out this command in Scripture. With brothers and sisters among us who claim to be Christians but are refusing to turn from their sin. Clear, deliberate, unrepentant sin. Now, the big question people ask 
at that point is, well, once we remove someone from the church, I mean, how do we treat that person? What do we do when we see this person in the grocery store? Is it really wrong to eat with them? What if they're a coworker? What if they're a family member? Well, does this mean this person's not even welcome to worship here? I mean, it says to treat them like, like they're apart from Christ, like a lost person. Well, I love lost people. I eat meals with lost people. People who don't know Christ. So these are good questions. There's so much we could discuss here. But here's the main point. When church excommunication happens, this signals, and it's all over the New Testament, a clear change in relationship. We see that here in 1 Corinthians 5. Don't associate with them, verse 9. Don't eat with them, verse 11. I'm not saying this. Paul's saying The Bible's saying this. 2 Thessalonians 3, 6. Keep away from a brother who is walking in idleness. Verse 14 of 2 Thessalonians 3. Have nothing to do with him. Warn him as a brother. Have nothing to do with him, Titus 3, 10. Do not receive him into your house or give him any greeting, 2 John 10. So there's a clear, biblically, there's a clear change in relationship here. So, well, uh, well, what about them? I mean, are we supposed to love them? Don't we care for them? Yes, we love them. Yes, we care for them. That's the whole point. This is how. We're not doing this because we've stopped loving for them. Now we don't like them, and so we're kicking them. No, we're doing this because God says this is the way you love them. There's a clear picture of isolation here, a change in relationship. And the difference here between somebody who, who, who doesn't know Christ and somebody who has been a member of the church, has claimed to be a Christian, maybe still is claiming to be a Christian, and has been removed from the church. Paul says, the Bible says, your relationship to that person should change so that this person, in being given over to the world, might see the effects and consequences of sin. And if there is any interaction, there is a continual call and continual prayer for repentance. So we pray. We don't stop praying. We don't stop longing for them to come back to Christ. But we trust in the process that God has laid out here. I think about members of our faith family just mentioned. Members that I know and I love this process has played out in their lives. So many have sought after them. They've refused to repent. And we've come to the point where we, I, have said to them, we're going to separate in this way, not associate with you, because we trust in God's Word. But we've made clear, made clear, I've been personally clear, some of these circumstances that I've been most involved with, that at the moment, at the instant, when you are willing to turn back to Christ, at the moment when you say, I just need some help, no, not just I, but a whole group of people, a whole body of believers is ready to love and serve you in every way we can. It's just not easy. Letting a person go like this, people you love, it's biblical. And this is particularly challenging when it comes to family members. This is why I put in the parentheses up there, remember also Ephesians 5, 1 Corinthians 7, other passages in the New Testament that talk about our biblical responsibilities as wives and husbands and parents and, and children. So clearly, if your husband or wife is walking in unrepentant sin and is excommunicated from the church, you are commanded in Scripture to love your husband and your wife and to fulfill your marital duties to them. So assuming there's not an issue of abuse or something along those lines. So, so you got a whole don't eat with him in Corinthians 5, 1 Corinthians 5, intention with fulfill your marital, marital duties with him in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. And that, that, that's not easy. But you do both. You, you do both. And you trust that, that, okay, in continually calling them to repentance, I'm obviously going to eat with my husband or eat with my wife. And there are marital duties providing for them relationally that are to be fulfilled here. That's what we see later in, in 1 Timothy. If you don't do this with your family, you don't take care of your family, you're worse than an unbeliever. So we do that. At the same time, there is, a, there is an undertone there that is continually longing for that person to repent. So we hold these in intention. I'm not saying this is easy, but I am saying to us today, let's be intentional about obeying God's Word in matters of discipline and dispute with the love of Christ. Second, and we'll go through these other three quickly. Let's trust in the authority of Christ. 
There's authority. Notice in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 4, Paul says, do this when you're assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus with the power of our Lord Jesus. So clearly, the most obvious objection to all of this when it comes to church discipline, church disputes is, well, who do you think you are? Do something like this in the church. And this is where we, we remember that we don't carry out these sorts of things based on any authority in us, but based solely on the authority that Christ has given to his church. Matthew chapter 18, verse 18. Jesus says, I tell you the truth, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, whatever you loose on earth will be loose in heaven. That's the authority that Christ has given to his church to declare people forgiven of their sin or not forgiven of their sin based upon their repentance and or belief in Christ. Let's trust in his authority. Let's pray according to his promise. Jesus said in Matthew 18, 19, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. Now that is one abused verse. That is not a blank check. You just find somebody else who wants what you want and ask God and poof, he'll give you whatever you, two of you, oh, you got two. All right, then I'll give you what you asked. Remember the context here. Jesus has just finished about what happens when when Two or three of you go to confront a brother in sin. Jesus is saying, know this. When you gather together in unison like this to confront sin in the church, know that you have the full support of the Father in heaven in what you are doing. Jesus knows that this church discipline thing is not easy. He knows that we will be tempted to shy away from it, not carry it out. So he encourages us here. When two or three people see unrepentant sin and a brother and sister or sister and are caring enough to address that, then know that the Father in heaven is ready to provide you with everything you need to address that. Which leads to the next thing. Let's be confident in his presence. He says in the very next verse, Matthew 18, 20, for where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I among them. Oh, maybe the most abused verse in all of Scripture. How many times has it said, well, where two or three are gathered, Jesus is there. Since we got two or three, we can know Jesus is here. Don't, don't say that. I mean, what about when you were praying earlier this morning? That means Jesus was waiting for somebody else to show up before he came into the picture? You didn't have a quorum? No, how many people does it take for Jesus to show up to a prayer meeting? How about one? So Jesus is saying here, when you're doing this difficult work of church discipline, when two or three of you are gathered with a brother or sister who's living in unrepentant sin, you're doing the tough work of gentle, loving confrontation, be assured of this. My presence, which is always with you, will be especially real, especially strong, and especially needed, and especially felt in the middle of that situation. Jesus says, when you're carrying this out, church, be assured, you will experience my presence in unique and powerful ways. That's confidence. So let's trust in the authority of Christ amidst discipline and disputes. Praying according to his promise, confidence in his presence. Let's obey with his love. Let's trust in his authority. Let's honor the cross of Christ. So do you remember what, when Paul talked about back in chapter 5, verse 6 and 7, turn back there, the yeast and the dough. Yeast, we talked about real quickly or leaven is a symbol throughout Scripture of sin. And Paul is saying here, get rid of the leaven, get rid of the yeast, the sin in your midst. Look at verses 6 and 7. Your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Cleanse out the old leaven, the yeast, that you may be a new lump, as you really are unleavened. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Oh, the picture here takes us all the way back to the Passover feast in the book of Exodus, where no leaven, no yeast was allowed to be in the bread that was eaten in the Passover feast. It was unleavened bread. Why? Because leaven was a symbol of slavery in Egypt, this old life of slavery from which they were being delivered. And so the Passover was a feast that celebrated deliverance from Egypt. So they purged the bread of all the leaven. And what Paul is saying here is, in a much greater way, Christ has been sacrificed as the Passover lamb. So don't live with leaven, yeast, sin in your midst. Get rid of it. He's paid the price for your deliverance, yet you're living like you're not delivered. That's the whole problem here. It's why we dress unrepentant sin in the church, because we're living like we've not been delivered from sin when we have been. Jesus has died to save us from our sins, and he's died to free us from our sins. So this is where we must face the question, church. This is what Paul, this question Paul was confronting the Corinthian church with, and what the Bible is confronting the church of Brook Hills with today. We want a Christ who pardons, but do we want a Christ who purifies? Have we become content in the contemporary church to bask in the forgiveness of Christ while we live apart from the holiness of Christ. 
And in our complete neglect of church discipline and contemporary churches across the board, today we are saying in the way we do church that we want a Christ who pardons, but we don't want a Christ who purifies. And we need to repent of this. We need to repent because we realize that when we tolerate unrepentant sin in the church, we trample on the sacrifice of Christ. The contemporary church, including, I fear, in these ways that we've addressed, the church at Brook Hills, is trampling on the sacrifice of Christ through outrageous, supposedly open-minded tolerance of unrepentant sin in the church. Let's honor the cross of Christ. And, and let's celebrate the new life we have in Christ. Let's celebrate new life in Christ. So six times in chapter six, Paul asks, do you not know? It's like he's desperate them, for them to know what they already should know, that their eyes will be open to certain things that are right in front of them. So see what Paul's saying here. And I'm thinking particularly here about chapter 6, verse 9 through 11. Realize, realize, do you not know, realize who you once were. He says in chapter 6, verse 9, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't be deceived. And then he lists examples of sinful deception in the church, including some of sexual immorality and homosexuality, which we're going to talk about in a couple of weeks. And, but then he gets to the end in verse 11, and he says, such were some of you. He says to these Christians at Corinth, you used to be these things. Your life used to be characterized by these things, but not anymore. Why not? Because of what he once did. God sent his son to take on your unrighteousness in your place as your Savior. Oh, hear this, Christian. Hear this, those of you who are not Christians. Hear this this morning. God has sent his son to die on the cross for our sins. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us in order that we might become the righteousness of God so that you, by trusting in Christ, might be forgiven of all your sins before God, reconciled, restored into a relationship with God. Jesus has died on the cross. He's risen from the grave in victory over sin so that you, by trusting in him, can be free from sin's reign over your life and sin's penalty in your life. So trust in him today if you never have. And if you have, realize what he has done. You've been washed. You've been sanctified. Realize then, don't you know who you now are? Such were some of you. Notice the key word midway through verse 11. Such were some of you, but. What a great but. You were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. You've got the Spirit of God in you now. We're going to see later in this chapter. You're a temple of the Holy Spirit. You were these things. You lived in unrepentant sin. But now you're washed and you're justified. That's why Paul said in the previous chapter, you really are unleavened. So don't let unrepentant sin remain in you and in the church when you have new life in Christ. And not even just new life now, but new life forever. Realize what you will be. Saints who will judge the world and the angels. Do you realize these things? Oh, do you see it? This is why we must do these things in the church. Because we want to celebrate the new life we have in Christ. So see it. Church discipline is not just about restoration. Church discipline, in the end, is about celebration. It's about celebrating the new life that we have because of the sacrifice of Christ on a cross for our sins. So realize this and rejoice because the death of Christ on the cross transforms our lives and our relationships in the church, which is what church discipline, church disputes, 1 Corinthians 5 and 6 is all about.